Okay, I guess we can start. So uh, we finished last week with um, just a statement that there is a critical point for the Rodham cluster model. So today I would like to spend uh, a little bit of time proving this theorem. So we basically have all the tools already, we just need to gather them and uh, it's going to be uh, fine. Okay, so as I said, in fact, I mean, infinite volume measures, random cluster measures are not defined uh, canonically. I mean, they are defined canonically, but there may be uh, many of them. But we identify these two special measures that were phi zero and phi one. So the infinite volume measure with free boundary conditions and the infinite volume measure with wired one. So let's use phi zero to define a potential PC. So let's define PC to be the infimum of the P for which um, the probability at zero, I mean, for free boundary condition of zero being connected to infinity, is strictly positive. Let's start with that. So by monotonicity, for any P which is strictly larger, then PC, what do I get? I get that phi zero PQ of zero connected to infinity is strictly positive. So this is a monotonicity in P. So that's the first property we use about our measures. The second one is one that I didn't prove, which is the fact that phi zero is ergodic. So I mentioned it, but didn't have time to prove it. And you can try to do it. It's the same strategy as Bernoulli percolation. So since phi zero PQ is ergodic, we did use that in fact, not only do you have a cluster, but you have it almost surely. So the probability of this thing is one. Then I told you, and this is something somebody asked me a question about that, and it was a good question. So then I told you any infinite volume measure you can imagine of random cluster, it has to be larger or equal to phi zero PQ. So I didn't tell you what an infinite volume measure is, so that's why I didn't want even to prove this statement. But trust me on that, whatever the way you do it, you don't even need to see this as a limit of finite volume measures because it's not clear at all that you can see an infinite volume measure as a limit of finite volume measures. But even without this condition, you can really prove that any infinite volume measure has, I mean, is larger or equal to this one. So since phi zero PQ is the smallest in sense of stochastic domination is the smallest infinite volume measure. We did use that it's true that phi PQ of there exists an infinite cluster is always equal to one for any infinite volume measure phi PQ uh, with parameters P and Q. So already we have half of the, the truth. We have the second part. Now let's try to see if we can get the first one. So indeed, for P smaller than PC, we have that 0 is connected to infinity with probability 0 for the free boundary condition, which implies that there is no infinite cluster for this guy. But notice that, so let's write it. So we have phi pq zero of there exists an infinite cluster, which is zero for any p strictly smaller than pc. And now I would like to deduce this for any measure. So since phi one is the largest one, it would be uh, sufficient to try to prove that this is true for the phi one. And we are going to do that as follows. So p, so fix p smaller than PC, and choose a P prime 
in PTC for which you have a unique infinite volume measure. So we know because the set of P's for which there is no uniqueness is on, only countable, we know we can choose such a P such that phi 1, I mean, yeah, phi 0 PQ, P prime Q is equal to phi 1 P prime Q. Then what you did use, so you see, I mean, everything is coming neatly now that we have the tools. So then what you did use is that phi 1 PQ of the resistance infinite cluster is smaller or equal to phi 1 P prime um, Q of the existing infinite cluster. This is just monotonicity. But this is equal to phi 0 p prime q, which is 0. So at parameter pq, now you also know that phi 1 pq of the resistant infinite cluster is true. And therefore, uh, phi pq of the existing infinite cluster is smaller than phi 1, which is 0. So this is the end of, of this proof. Notice here there are two, two tricks, two things that are not completely straight, straightforward. Notice I work with the existing infinite cluster and not 0 connected to infinity. The reason for that is that, OK, I could put 0 connected to infinity and do the same reasoning, because I'm just using the fact that the, this is increasing. It's an increasing event. So I could put 0 connected to infinity, 0 connected to infinity everywhere. I would get that for any random cluster model, I mean, infinite volume measure. The probability that 0 is connected to infinity is 0. <coughs> but notice that I never told you that the unique, I mean, that every infinite volume measure was invariant under translation. And in fact, it's a priori not true. So this would imply this would not imply a priori that there is no infinite cluster. It's not because 0 is not connected. In fact, you could easily relate the two. First, you could say that here you took 0, but you could take any x connected to infinity, and you will get the same conclusion and so on. But my point is that here, I just want to draw your attention on the fact that infinite volume measures have no reason to be invariant under translation a priori. Phi 0 and phi 1 are, but not 0. So. The second thing that I wanted to highlight is the fact that I really choose a p prime between p and pc, so this p prime is not a priori p. And we are going to see examples where actually for the free measure you don't have an infinite cluster, and for the wired measure you do, at some prescribed p. So here we really use all the extent of the fact that we can choose a p prime which is between p and pc. So this type of argument will not work at PC. There is just a last thing that I didn't do here. Uh, finally, or, or let's say, okay, this let's close like that. And just a remark is that when this infinite cluster exists, it's unique, in fact. So you can prove that when the infinite cluster exists for phi 0, say, or phi 1. It is unique. And this is just a burton keen argument. Try to rerun the burton keen argument, and it's going to work very, very well. The only place where it's going to change, so this is Burton Keen. The only place where it changes is the fact that in the Burton Keen argument that I presented for percolation, at some point I really use that, okay, I condition on everything outside the box, and inside it's independent percolation. And I can construct this trifurcation. Here you do not have independence. But the only thing you need to know is you need to know that it's going to only cost you a finite cost to open a certain number of edges and close a certain number of edges. But this is a direct consequence of finite energy, the finite energy property that I mentioned last week. So here, just where independence is replaced by finite energy. 
This is a very interesting exercise just to try to run the argument and to see that really everything works perfectly. Very well. And once again, it's for phi 0 and phi 1 because a priori I need translational invariance. So on a measure which would not be one of these two, I could have troubles. OK, so there is a critical point, and it has all the properties that you want to have. I mean, it to have. Just one uh, remark to conclude. Remember that we said uh, that, I, I think we said it uh, last week, or the week before, we said that uh, spontaneous magnetization for the POTS model, which, remember, is the limit when n tends to infinity of the uh, mu 1 beta, I mean, lambda n beta q of sigma 0 1. I think I defined it like that, right? Something like that. So it's how much the spin is at 0 is aligned with the boundary conditions. I told you last week, I mean, two weeks ago, that by the coupling, this is exactly like phi 1 lambda n p q of 0 connected to infinity, where p and uh, beta are related by the relation that beta is minus q minus 1 over q log of 1 minus p. Uh, beta connected to the boundary of the box, sorry. And here, it's a very simple exercise to check that this quantity, when n tends to infinity, gets to this thing. Just because it's a weak convergence of these measures to this one, here it's not an e the event itself changes, but you can very easily check that. It's, I mean, it's an infimum of an infimum, so there's no problem with that. But so the conclusion is that beta c of q, I mean, we have a direct relation. It's minus q minus 1 over q log of 1 minus pc of q. Right? If you take beta, which is larger than this quantity, p is going to be larger than pc of q, and this quantity is going to be strictly positive. So the spontaneous magnetization is indeed non-zero. And if p is small, uh, beta is smaller than beta c, then p is smaller than pc of q, and you get that this quantity is zero, so you get zero spontaneous magnetization. That's, um, so we have a direct, if we want to compute the critical value of the, random, of the POTS model, it's sufficient to compute the one of the random cluster model. I really, I mean, I really want to highlight the fact that except for the easing model where you can save the day with some special differential, I mean, correlation inequalities, which by the way are not easy at all to get, Except for the easing model, I actually do not know any proof of the fact that there is a beta c for the POTS model, which is not involving the random cluster model. So somehow you really get this thing. I mean, this small coupling gives you really a lot. And you are going to see it's going to go even farther. Because now the goal, so five, is to actually compute beta c of q. Let's compute it. Computation of PC of Q, and therefore, if you get PC of Q, you get beta C of Q. OK, so the theorem is the following. I'm going to be, so in general, exactly like for percolation, right? For percolation, except in dimension 2, where we know that PC is 1 half, in higher dimension, we are not really expecting that there is a special value for this PC just a number between 0 and 1, and its best definition is probably just to be the critical value of, of percolation. There is not, it's not even going to be rational or algebraic. I mean, there is no reason, at least, to believe that. So here, it's going to be the same. For d larger or equal to 3, no reason to have any closed formula for PC. But in dimension 2, you have a theorem saying the following. So let d equal 2 then pc of q is equal to square root of q over 1 
per square root of q. And here, once again, we are always, anyway, if we speak of PC, is that I'm taking q larger or equal to 1 because I cannot prove the existence of PC for q smaller or equal to 1. So here we get this relation, and the remark that you can notice is that q equal 1, you recover PC of 1 equal 1 half. Right? So all of this is coherent. So let me try to, to tell you a little bit uh, more about uh, this theorem. Before that, I'm going to just mention another remark, which is that you can prove, in fact, that for one can also prove that for p smaller than pc, there exists a constant c such that if I take phi 1 of pq, then the probability of being connected to distance n decays exponentially fast. So you get exactly what you get for percolation. So there, there is no uh, surprise. And, uh, but I no noticed that I only stated that for d equal 2. It is a big and open question and very interesting one to try to get exponential decay in subcritical in any dimension. Because in, for percolation, we really had that even if we cannot compute PC in dimension 3 or in, dimension, uh, in any dimension, you were still able to say that whatever P you take below PC, you have exponential decay. Here, it's really, really not the case. The constant is independent of Q. Sorry, the constant is only dependent of P or? Uh, P and Q, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, let me first try to hint why this is a nice value, and then I will give you a sketch of the proof. And actually, I think in the exercises, I will make you uh, do the proof because it's a slightly long proof. But at the end, it's now we have a proof which is fairly elementary. So I think it's more interesting if you do it yourself rather than if I do a two-hour proof. Uh, and like that, it's going to be a six-hour exercise, which is much more fun, right? Uh, OK. But why square root of q over 1 per square root of q? So how did we define, I mean, how did we guess that 1 half was the right value for percolation? We noticed that there is a dual model to percolation. And this model had, was percolation with parameter 1 minus p. So here we are going to try to do the same. So define, as before, so this is going to be duality. Or actually, I'm going to just state directly proposition. So let g be a finite graph, finite subgraph of z2. <laughs> And let's take psi. So we have to be careful. We have boundary conditions for the random cluster model. So I'm going to take psi, which is just a configuration on the edges which are not the edges of G. So I'm going to, here I'm going to state planarity, I mean, duality just for planar boundary conditions, but that's already uh, interesting enough. And then. What I'm going to say is, OK, if omega is simple according to the random cluster model on G with parameter P and Q and with boundary condition psi, then, then omega star, so you remember omega star is, I mean, defined exactly like percolation. It's just omega star, so let's put it here omega star of E star is 1 minus omega E. OK, so for every edge of the primal lattice, the edge of the dual one is open if and only if the edge of the primal is closed. It's the same definition as before. So then omega star is simple according to a random cluster measure on the dual graph, necessarily. So G star with parameter P star and Q star and with boundary condition psi star. So what are all these things? So G star, 
G star is a graph with edge set, which is a set of E star for E in uh, the edges of G. Okay? So you, take the, you construct the dual graph by saying the edges of the dual graph are just the edges associated, the dual edges associated to the edges of the primal one. And then the vertices, well, the vertices you have to take the endpoints of these guys. And vertex set given by the endpoints. So indeed, if you define the dual configuration like that, it's exactly defined on G star, so that's good. Then I need to tell you what Xi star is. Well, Xi star, I don't even need to tell you what it is because by definition, it's just what you obtain by taking the dual of Xi. Okay? So on the other edges, it's just one minus zero. So Xi star is, is defined already. And I need to tell you what Q star and P star are. So Q star, so where this is the first thing. The second property is Q star is just Q, in fact. And P star satisfies P star times P times 1 minus, I mean, divided by 1 minus P star, 1 minus P is equal to Q. So is it clear for everybody what we, uh, we have done here? So this guy is indeed uh, defined on the right graph, and it, has, it is a random cluster measure with some boundary condition psi star, and some parameter p star and q star. q star is q, very good. So it's a random cluster measure with the same cluster weight, but with another edge parameter, which is defined by this equation. And just maybe a few remarks. Oh, mm -hmm. You know that I made exactly the reverse mistake in my first year class. Like I was writing with Ks everywhere and then they started panicking. What is Rn key? Okay, I mean that's... <laughs> anyway, um, if Q equal 1, here we should get P star equal 1 minus P, right? But that's exactly what you get. So if you get p star p divided by 1 minus p star 1 minus p equal 1, this is exactly equal to, I mean, equivalent to p star equal 1 minus p. So you, you, uh, you find the same thing. The second remark I want to make is that let's take psi equal 0. Let's take free bonding condition. Then, psi star is equal to 1. And you recover the uh, very interesting feature of duality, which is that it maps free bond decodition to wired and vice versa. Actually, one should be a little bit careful about that, because it's not quite true. If I take a graph, but I put holes in it, like that. Then when I take free bonding condition, very well, it's like that. The wired bonding condition is going to be what? It's going to be I'm going to wire everybody on the bond, on the thing here, but it's not wired to the guys here. Here, it's wired just together, and here it's wired together. So it is true when you take a simply connected graph somehow. If I don't have holes, Indeed, the dual of free boundary condition is exactly going to be the wired one as I define, meaning everybody on the boundary is wired together. If you have holes, it's not quite true. But anyway, we will always apply it in the case of a box, basically. So there won't be this uh, difficulty. But I just wanted to draw your attention on this small subtlety. The other uh, last remark I want to make is I think it's the third last remark I'm making, but that's fine. Uh, 
is that the boundary condition here, I'm assuming they are planar. So I'm assuming, I mean, need to assume that uh, psi is planar. So what I mean by a planar boundary condition is I mean a boundary condition which is induced by a planar configuration. So the archetypical example of a non-planar boundary condition is going to be periodic boundary conditions. When you make the boundary condition, you identify the guy in such a way that, in fact, your graph is a torus. There, it's not going to work. The dual of a, bond, of a random cluster model with, I mean, on a torus is not a random cluster model on the torus. And this, I think, there was an exercise on that or something like that. In the, in the, or there would be. Anyway. OK, let's try to prove that. Oh, OK. Didn't put the proof here. I have the proof here. Good. So let's uh, remember that so we, we need to compute by definition when I look at this quantity. So what I want is I want to say, OK, I want to identify, I want to write this quantity in terms of omega star. Because this is the probability of omega star. Omega and omega star are in bijection, right? So I want to write this thing in terms of omega star. So there is a big partition function. Then I have p to the number of open edges, 1 minus p to the number of closed edges, q to the number of clusters of omega psi. So I need to write this thing, this thing, and this thing in terms of uh, of omega star. So the first thing I'm going to do is, remember here, I can just, so now let's, I mean, I don't care about what this quantity is. It's just a constant which is not depending on the configuration. So I'm just going to call it C, and this C is going to change at every step, but that's OK. So if I multiply here, I can just look at P over 1 minus P to the number of open edges, Q to the number of clusters of omega psi. I just use the fact that the number of closed edges is, one, is the number of total edges minus the number of open edges. And the number of total edges doesn't depend on the configuration. So I include it in this C. So the difficulty is getting these two guys. O of omega, so the number of open edges of omega, it's very easy to see that it's just the number of edges in G minus the number of open edges of omega star. You have as many open edges in omega star as closed edges in omega, so you get this quantity. So here, if I put C, pro, I mean, so let's say this is C0, now this is C1, and here I get P over one, I mean, 1 minus P over P to the number of open edges in omega star this time. So this is perfect, it's what I wanted. Q to the number of clusters of omega psi. Yes, Sorry? There? P star, 1 minus P star, P star. Now it's just 1 minus P. Then I'm going to modify it in 1 minus P star. But here I just replace this O of omega by this quantity. And that gives me this. I mean, this quantity is included in that. Then I'm going to indeed make the change. So here you see that what I need to understand is how to express the number of clusters is in omega psi in terms of the dual configuration. So what I'm going to do, remember omega psi is omega uh, with, I mean, identified edges, uh, identified vertices. What do I get when I take the dual of omega psi as a graph, as a planar graph? Well, in fact, you can check that you are going to get exactly, so the dual of omega psi, and I'm going to denote it omega psi star. So here, it's not the dual in terms of configuration. It's really the dual in terms of planar graph. It is a planar graph, so it has a dual. You put in the middle of every face a vertex, and then edges between adjacent faces. 
I mean, uh, between edges, co uh, vertices corresponding to adjacent uh, faces. Well, is simply, you can check, it's simply omega star psi star. In fact, I'm cheating. There may be an additional isolated vertex, but this is not relevant for the computation. So let's ignore that. <coughs> so the dual of this guy is this guy. Now, that means that the number of clusters, if I look at the clusters of omega psi, well, it's very easy to see that the number of clusters of omega psi is exactly corresponding to the number of faces in the dual. The number of cluster in a graph is exactly the number of faces in the dual. So here, it's going to be the number of faces. I'm going to call it f of omega star psi star. So now it's very good. I express everything. So this quantity, I can express it in terms of the dual configuration. And actually, it's very good because I even see this psi star appearing, which is a very good thing, because that's the boundary condition I'm aiming for. The only thing is that it's faces. And I do not want to express in terms of faces, but in terms of open edges and uh, closed edges. So in fact, here, the only thing that we are going to use is what? Exactly. We are going to use Euler formula to re-express f of g, so this quantity by Euler formula, is equal, so let me just not make a mistake, to the number of edges in omega psi, uh, omega star psi star, plus the number, OK, let me not even. It's early uh, clusters in omega psi uh, star psi star plus 1, and we get minus the number of vertices in omega star psi star. This is equal to that. But here, notice the number of vertices is constant. It doesn't depend on the configuration. So all of this is a constant. And the number of edges is just what we defined as just the number of open edges in omega star psi star. Okay? When we make the identification between a configuration and a graph, it was exactly saying the edges were all the open edges of the configuration. So I get this thing. So when I tune in back there, I get a C2 because I have this constant to the power q, I mean q to this, uh, this power. And then I'm going to get a q times 1 minus p over p open edges in omega star. And now q to the number of cluster in omega star psi star. So this is perfect. What I just need to say is that I want this thing, I don't want it, that's where p star is going to appear. This thing, I don't want it to be equal to that. I want it to be equal to p star 1 minus p star. And in this case, I just recover the random cluster configuration. So here, this is going to be C2. And with my definition of p star, it's 1 minus p star, open edges of omega star, q to the number of clusters. And that's the end of the proof. So you see, I mean, planarity is used when you use your formula. If you don't have planarity and say you are on a torus, then you need to use the equivalent of your formula on the torus, and you are going to have an additional correcting term. It's not going to be a big one, so it's not going to be, I mean, the random cluster model on the torus is almost self-dual. Uh, it's just that you, are, you have a term which is going to tell you whether you have clusters which construct, say, I mean, which wrap on the torus, around the torus or not. So you will have a topological term. And this is actually a very interesting uh, feature. And for the easing model, we have some specialists here about this type of questions. OK, so that tells me that there is a duality. But now, exactly as for percolation, it's natural to introduce the point which is self-dual. So let us introduce a 
big self-dual of Q. And this guy is a guy for which to be the unique, the unique solution. of P star equal P. And in this case, you can very easily see that it gives you P square over 1 minus P square equal Q. So it exactly gives you P over 1 minus P equal square root of Q. So it's exactly square root of Q over 1 plus square root of Q. So once again, we are doing the same as for percolation. We are trying to prove that the self dual point is the critical point. Now, how do we do that? How did we do it for percolation? Remember, we had two inequalities to do. We had somehow to rule out the fact that, OK, if I am at the self dual point and I'm assuming I have an infinite cluster, then I'm going to have an infinite cluster in the dual, and I'm going to have coexistence of, an, of two infinite clusters, a primal and dual. And we said this was contradictory. So this part was based on which argument? It was based on this uh, Zeng argument involving uniqueness. I told you, for random cluster model, you have uniqueness. You don't have independence, but once again, you use independence in this Zeng argument only when you do this fact that, I mean, when you open all the, or close all the edges inside the box. But the finite energy property replaces independence very well at this point. You don't need independence. You just need the finite energy property. So this seems to be saying that it's easy to say that at the self-dual point, you don't have coexistence. There is one tiny, tiny, tiny trick here, is that when we took the dual of the uh, percolation, it was exactly percolation, right? Here, if I take the dual cell of the wired boundary conditions, I'm going to get indeed a uh, random cluster measure, but with free boundary conditions. So for instance, if I assume I have an infinite cluster for the wired boundary conditions, well, it's not going to tell me that I have an infinite cluster in the dual because it's with the free boundary condition in the dual, and the two measures are not the same. Actually, we will see that for some values of Q, there, you have an infinite cluster for the random and not for, uh, for the wired and not for the free. So here, you just need to be slightly careful. And the theorem that you can prove just by running the argument of, uh, due to Zeng is that for any Q larger or equal to 1, phi 0 P self dual Q of 0 connected to infinity is 0. Because if you assume that for the free you have an infinite cluster, then in the dual it's going to be the wired boundary condition, so you will also have an infinite cluster in the dual. And this, you can start to run Zeng argument. OK, so be very careful about this, this subtlety that here, if you assume phi 1, you cannot say that there is an infinite cluster in the dual, and therefore you cannot run Zeng argument. But if you start with free, it's, it's OK. And this is sufficient. This, I mean, if we, for free boundary condition, you don't have an infinite cluster, you know, as a corollary, you did use that PC of Q is larger or equal to P self the whole of Q. So this part of the proof, I mean, it's, it's a little bit strange because in the way the, the, the class was organized, for percolation, we first prove the exponential decay, and therefore, I mean, the other inequality was trivial, and we had to prove this one. And this was the one which was a little bit more difficult to prove because we had to present the Zeng argument. But once again, historically, it was kind of—it's a misconception uh, that I mean, I led you somewhere, uh, I mean, wrongly somehow, because indeed historically, this inequality is always the simplest one, and that's the other one which is difficult. So this inequality is simple. Here, for instance, it's known for a very long time for random cluster models that PC is larger or equal to square root of Q over 1 plus square root of Q. But now the difficult part is to try to prove the other inequality, because here we don't have exponential decay. We don't know it yet. We need to prove it. And that's the difficult part. So 
Now we need to focus, we need to prove the other inequality. I mean, we need to prove PC of Q smaller or equal to PC of the whole of Q. And if we would have exponential decay, it would be easy, but we don't. So let me sketch the proof, and once again, there will be exercises where you are going to actually do the details of the proof. What is going to be the idea? So we want to prove, okay, our aim. So we, it's sufficient to actually prove that whatever, whatever uh, p larger than p self dual, I have zero connected to infinity with positive probability. Why? Because that means if you have that for certain p, it means that p is larger or equal to pc. If this is true for any p larger than p self dual, then it implies that pc has to be smaller or equal to p self dual. So that's our goal. Now, how can you prove there is a, an infinite cluster? Well, what you can try to do is you can imagine for a moment, let, let's be nice with ourselves, that we have some bricks, you know, of, I mean, some boxes where you know that you have nice crossing. For instance, let's imagine proposition that there exists for any p larger than p self dual, there exists a constant c, which is going to depend on p and q, such that, imagine it's very small, okay? Such that when I look at a box of size n times 2n, the probability of being crossed from left to right is larger or equal to 1 minus n to the minus c. So imagine that. I can cross a box of size n, and let's make it a little bit long. I mean, that's the same type of, type of subtlety that for the rousseau simon wedge theory, I'm going to need it to be long. And imagine that not only it tends to 1, but you have also an estimate, like it tends fairly quickly to 1. How can I construct an infinite cluster almost surely for this p? I mean, or, I mean prove that 0 is connected to infinity with positive probability for this p. Well, I can do the following construction. So then, what I can do is I can start from 0 and say, OK, 0 is connected to 1, 0. Then in this box of size 2 times 1, I have a crossing like that. In the, here, of course, I mean, if it is a box of size 2 times 1, I mean, the crossing is going to be something like that, but whatever. Then 2 times 4 a crossing like that, 4 times 8, a crossing like that, etc., etc. Let's assume I have that up to infinity. What is the probability of having all of these crossings together? You agree if I have all of them together, I have a path from 0 to infinity. So the probability that 0 is connected to infinity is larger or equal to the product for uh, n equal 1, or for k equal 1 to infinity, k equal 0 to infinity, of phi 1 pq, this is the fkg inequality, that is going to tell me I want all of them. Now they are all increasing events, so the probability of the intersection is larger or equal to the product of the probabilities. And the probability at the kth step is exactly probability of crossing a box of size 2 to the k, 2 to the k plus 1, like that. Okay? Sometimes it is actually vertical, but that's by rotation the same thing. Okay? But now this is exactly 1 minus 1 over 2 to the k times c. So this infinite product is converging. So it's strictly positive. So what did I just do here? I just argue that it's sufficient to prove this quantity, that, uh, to prove this proposition. So it's going to be sufficient to construct, I mean, to study crossing probabilities, and it's probably even one, I mean, 
yet another argument going in the direction of the fact that the rousseau semmelweis theorem is useful somehow, that this, in 2D, looking at these crossing probabilities are inter is interesting. So we are just going to look at this quantity and try to prove this theorem. OK? Uh, break. So how do we prove that? So we are going to proceed in two steps. The first one is going to be to uh, prove that it doesn't tend to 0 at p self dual. And the second one is going to be for people who, oh, I tell you, almost everybody was here on Monday. It's perfect. Then we are going to prove that p gives this probability has a sharp threshold. We are exactly going to prove that. So, here we have this p self dual, and if I draw the, uh, the graph of this function, I want to prove that it's like that. So there are kind of two, two arguments. The first one is proving that it has a sharp threshold. The second one is locating it. So saying, yes, in fact, it has, and it is exactly at self dual point that it passes near uh, half. So let's start by this second step. Let's say that at the self dual point, it's not so difficult. And let's start with exactly like for percolation, there was one step that was easy, which was if I take a square box, I have that the crossing probability is a half, roughly a half. Here, can I do the same? So if I take phi 1 p self dual q of a crossing n by n, what do I get? Well, as before, I get the same, I mean, the probability of the complement is going to be the probability of having a dual crossing blocking the primal one, and this is equal to one. But this is what? It's just phi zero p self dual q of crossing like that n by n. And because it's a n by n, is the same thing as crossing like that. But here, the phi, is, uh, phi 1 is larger or equal to phi 0. So this implies that phi 1 p self dual q of crossing a box n by n is larger or equal to a half. So really notice here that this is true only for wired boundary condition. I would take the free, this would be utterly wrong. Because I could not compare these guys. These guys, these guys can be very different. But we have that. The problem is that we want n times 2n, or say n times 3n. And this is much harder, because this is exactly the content of the rousseau semmelweis theorem for percolation, that if we have crossing with a certain aspect ratio, you have crossing with a larger aspect ratio as well. But here, there is a theorem, very recent, due to Vincent, which says the following. It says, if, I mean, if I take a measure satisfying the FKG inequality, so in particular, our measure here, if the infimum of n of the phi 1 p self dual q of an n by n box like that is strictly positive, then, well, what you would like to say is that the infimum for the n times 2n box is going to be also positive. This will be the content of the rousseau semmelweis theorem, saying if I have crossing of a box of size n, then I have crossing of a box of size 2n times n. Here it's not as strong. But it still tells you the, the lim soup of the phi 1 p self dual q. And let's, let me just say n 3n, because for some technical reason you need something like that, is positive. So it's a very nice theorem. It's weaker than the rousseau semmelweis theory. And you are going to see that we are going to be able to prove more afterwards. But it still tells you that at least Along subsequential limits, this thing, I mean, uh, I mean, the, there is a uh, subsequent uh, subsequence 
of n for which this thing is strictly positive uniformly in n at the critical par parameter, at the self-dual parameter. So now what we need to prove is we need to prove that there is a sharp threshold. And what we would deduce from that is that at least for infinitely many n, I have an inequality of this type. OK, okay. so I didn't tell you yet how you prove that you have a sharp threshold. And actually, I didn't even tell you how you express the derivative of an increasing event in terms, I mean, for, for the random cluster measure. So let's just first prove the following. I still call it Rousseau's formula, even if it's not for percolation. It was not proved by Rousseau, but it's exactly the equivalent of Rousseau's formula for, for random cluster. And it says, if I mean, whatever, let x, I mean, a be an event on G, then if I differentiate phi, I mean, G, P, Q, psi of A, what I'm going to get is a sum over the edges of my graph of the following, phi psi gpq of indicator of a omega e minus phi psi gpq of a phi psi gpq of omega e. So what does it say? It is saying that if I want to have the differential of, I mean, the, the derivative of this, the probability of my event, this is the sum over the edges of the covariance between the indicator of the event A and whether the edge is open or not. OK, omega E equal 1 means edge open. Omega E equal 0 means edge closed. So it's exactly, a con it's exactly uh, how you compute the derivative. And the proof. It's just differentiation. I'm not even going to do it because you just differentiate the ratio. You just write, OK, this guy is the sum of a configuration of p number of omega edges, 1 minus p number of closed edges, q number of clusters, indicator of a of omega, divided by the sum quantity without the indicator. And you just differentiate it. It's very simple you get the quantity on the uh, above. In fact, it's something which is very general. This type of formula, they, they arise everywhere. It's just a form. It's just you are differentiating the ratio, and basically it comes for free. So this, I leave it to you as a very simple exercise. Now, let's look at this quantity here. So. When I let's drop the psi GPQ for a second. So you are looking at this thing. Okay. Let's write it in terms of omega e equal one and omega e equal zero. So this is what? This is phi this is phi of uh, the first one is just phi of A intersected with omega e equal one, because if omega e equals zero, this thing is zero minus phi of a, and the other one here is phi of, I can also write it as phi of the event omega e equal 1. So it's really, you see the correlation between the two. And this here, what you can do is you can just write it as a certain constant, depending only on p, times what we call the influence of an edge. And the influence of an edge is phi of a knowing omega e equal 1 minus phi of a knowing omega e equal 0. So how do you do that? You just divide by phi of omega e equal 1 here. So I mean, maybe, maybe I don't do it, right? It's, it's really a very simple computation. Here you divide by omega, phi of omega e equal 1. So you divide by this. OK, let me do it. Okay. <laughs> So it's phi of i 
uh, so it's phi of omega e equal one, and then I get phi of a knowing omega e equal one minus phi of a. Okay. And phi of a, I can write it. So here, I can write it as phi of a knowing omega e equal one, phi of omega e equal one. And I have also phi of a knowing omega e equals zero, phi of omega e equals zero. Okay, this sum is equal to phi of a. And this, if I'm not mistaken, I get phi of a knowing omega equal one factor of one minus phi of omega equal one. So this is just phi of omega equal one, phi of omega equal zero because it factors. And then I get I a of e. So this I a of e is called the influence of an edge. I a of b e is called the influence of the edge e. And notice that it is directly related to the property of being pivotal. Because in fact here, when I look at that, or when I look at that, say, what is phi of a knowing omega e equal one? It's almost like phi of a, I mean, omega top e equal one. So this is almost like this guy. Except that in order to have that for percolation, I need to open the edge e. So I'm going to have a factor in front. So this guy, you can express it easily in the case of percolation as I mean, uh, related to uh, to priority of being pivotal. So, in fact, for percolation, you have that I A of E times P one minus P because uh, is equal to uh, the probability of E pivotal. But in general, for more general random cluster model. For, per, for per, I mean Bernoulli percolation. For more general cluster weights, this relation is not true anymore. Simply because you cannot open the, I mean, the edge E is not independent, and whether the edge E is open or not, is not independent of the fact that you are pivotal anymore because you are related by, um, by the boundary conditions. But think really of the influence as a generalization of the priority of being pivotal. Okay. So in particular, we get that d over dp of phi xi gpq of a is up to this quantity. just the sum of the influences. And on Monday, you saw that there were, I mean, he mentioned it briefly, Daniel mentioned it briefly, that there is a theorem related the influence, I mean, the priority of being pivotal, uh, I mean, the sum of the priority to be pivotal to actually the largest influence. So there's a theorem by can, Kali and lineal, which says for any uh, graph, I mean, anyway, there exists a constant C such that for any A, and I'm going to write it with inferences because for percolation, it's, it's roughly like, uh, like uh, the priority of being pivotal. So what they wrote in this case is that the sum of the influences is always larger or equal 
to phi of a, 1 minus phi of a. And here I get the log of 1 over the maximal influence. So this is the result that they prove for, um, for, for Bernoulli percolation. And uh, Grimet and Graham extended this result to every Q larger or equal to 1. So here, the, the, the important part of the story is that if the influences are small, then the sum of the influences cannot be too small. So you understand now what is going to be the game. The game is going to be to say, OK, let's take a crossing event. And let's exactly say that the maximal influence for this crossing event cannot be big. If I prove that, then I prove that the sum of the influences has to be fairly big. But if the sum of the inferences is big, it also gives me that then the derivative is big. OK? Just this Grimm, the, the extension by Grimet and Graham, they do not reprove the result for q equal 1. What they do is that they prove that the influences of uh, uh, an event A for the random cluster measure can be rewritten as the probability of being pivotal for a certain event B, but for Bernoulli percolation. So you rephrase your problem into a problem just based on Bernoulli percolation. Okay? So this can Calai and lineal result is, is absolutely beautiful result. And, um, and for this reason, I ask Matan to actually prove this to you next week. So there is class next week, and if he has no time to finish, maybe there is class the week after just to finish this part. It is a beautiful theorem, and I want just to tell you why I love this theorem so much. It's one of my favorite results in mathematics. Because I think, despite the fact that you see it's proved using discrete Fourier analysis and things like that, and I mean, a physicist could look at you with his big eyes and say, what the heck is going on in your mind? It is actually giving you something which is physically very, very natural. It's the following. Imagine that all the influences are the same. So take an event which is very symmetric. So assume all influences are equal. Then there are two cases. Either they are all larger than, say, log n over n. If they are all larger than log n over n, they are all equal. So the sum of the influences is larger than, I mean, log n over n times phi, uh, phi of a, 1 minus phi of a. I, I should say something. The probability of an event remains between 0 and 1, right? So if the probability is close to 1 or close to 0, the derivative cannot be big. It's just, it cannot be. And it's exactly what this thing is telling you. It's exactly telling you that when you approach 0 or 1, you should rescale somehow. You cannot hope to always have a big derivative. If you are close to 0, this is telling you the derivative that you are getting is not so big. In fact, it's a logarithmic derivative. You need to divide by phi of a to get a big derivative. So the derivative divided by phi of a is the derivative of the log. Let me just finish. So then the derivative of the log is big, even when uh, the probability of a is close to 0. And on the contrary, when you are close to 1, is the derivative of log of 1 minus the probability, which, is, uh, which can be big. But the, probability, the derivative itself cannot because of this. So this introducing what, I mean, this is just a variance of the indicator of a is a very, very natural thing to do. Very natural because you want to be able to say that when you are close to 1 or 0, you don't have a big derivative. So this is a very important term. But what we are interested in is really what is after. Yes? Um, so what you just said about finding phi of a is equal to 1 or 0, and the derivative should be small. I mean, this is a, 
the lower bound. So you're kind of saying that really exactly. So yeah, what I'm saying is that it cannot be that you don't have this term. This term has to be here. So it is indeed just a lower bound. I'm not saying it's an upper bound, but I'm saying if you would not have this term in this lower bound, that would be contradictory. It's not surprising at all to get this term. That's what I meant. But yes, that's a good comment. OK, so if this is larger than log n over n phi of a 1 minus phi of a, you get that the derivative then, the derivative of phi of a over dp is larger or equal to phi of a 1 minus phi of a log of n. Right? Just I sum these guys over every edge. I don't even need, like n here is a, the number of edges that are involved in A. Okay? <coughs> so if, you am, if I am on a box of size n, it's going to be n squared here. Right? So in this case, you have a derivative like that. If it is smaller or equal to log n over n phi of a, 1 minus phi of a, then here I can put this here. And what do I get? I'm going to get log of n once again. So I re-get a log of n. And therefore, I get a, yet again this thing. So here you apply kkl, and you get this automatically. So what I'm telling you is that if all the inferences are equal, then in fact, you don't even need to prove anything. You don't need to prove that the biggest inference is not too big, because if it is, you are already done, and you already fly. And if it's not, then you can apply the KK theorem. So it's, gonna, it's telling you something very, very important physically from my point of view. It's, gonna te it's telling you that an event which is symmetric always has a sharp threshold. And this, most of the events in physics, most of the macroscopic events in physics, they do satisfy this property because they depend kind of symmetrically of all the, all the, the particles. If the particles are not distinguishable, then they are all going to get an, a similar inference, and you should get a sharp threshold. So all these theorems about phase transitions and so on, why should you get a phase transition and so on, is basically encapsulated, I mean, encoded in this theorem, which is telling you, yes, you should get a sharp threshold because a global property of your system should be encoded into an event which has, I mean, every part of the place has basically the same influence. Therefore, you should get a sharp threshold. So I like very much this, uh, this theorem for this reason. And that's why I mean, a lot of my research this, uh, well, since my beginning, actually, is based on trying to apply the sharp threshold to prove sharpness of the phase transition, so exponential decay. Or, because I think this is actually very moral, somehow. This is actually telling you exactly why there should be a phase transition. It's because there is no other way. Whatever the system you look at, if it's symmetric, you should have something like that. OK, so why does this imply a sharp threshold? I should maybe prove to you this, because this is something you need to see it once, at least in your life. So this tells you that the derivative, so derivative of phi of a divided by this, by phi of a 1 minus phi of a. What is the derivative of a, uh, if you take f, pr f prime divided by f 1 minus f? This is a derivative of log of wave f over 1 minus f. So it's telling you that the derivative of the log of phi of a 1 minus phi of a is always larger than log n. OK? So now if you apply that between so if you apply that between p and p prime, so between, so integrate p0 and p1, and then what do you get? Well, you get that phi p of a, phi p1 of a divided by 1 minus phi p1 of a is larger or equal to phi p0 of a 
divided by 1 minus phi p0 of a. And here you get an exponential, or if you prefer, n to, uh, and here there is, a, uh, there is this constant c that dropped somewhere, c p1 minus p0. Okay, that's just the integration of my differential equation between p0 and p1. And now you notice two things. Imagine, so this tells you, for instance, that, so assume phi p0 of a larger than, say, a half or something like that. Then, uh, or let's assume, yeah, uh, larger than half. Then what do you get? You get 1 minus phi p1 of a smaller or equal, I'm going to pass everything on the other side. Okay, this guy, I pass it here, and this, I pass it here. So this guy is here, phi of p1 of a is smaller than 1, 1 minus phi, zero, phi p0 of a is smaller than 1, so I get just less or equal to 1 over phi p0 of a, and here I get the n to the minus c p1 minus p0, and I assume phi, zero, uh, phi p0 of a larger or equal to, actually I could have said c, I don't know why. So this is smaller or equal to 1 over c, n to the minus c, p1 minus p0. So it tells you if at some p0 I have a bond like that, then I have actually a fairly good bond. This guy is very close to 1 now, and it's completely quantitative. On the other hand, if you assume just for, you, uh, for, for uh, illustration, that phi p1 of a is smaller than constant. Then you can check that you are going to get that phi p0 of a is necessarily small. Uh, smaller than 1 minus constant, sorry. Because here what you are going to get is that this guy is not too small, this guy is smaller than one, this guy is smaller than one, so this guy is smaller than something not too, uh, not too big, sorry, times n to the minus cp1 minus p0. So it exactly tells you, this is phi, p1, uh, phi p0 of a is going to be smaller than one over one minus phi p1 of a, n to the minus c p1 minus p0. Okay, so this is really telling you, take the p for which you have one half, so choose p uh, two such that phi p two of a is equal to one half, and there what you see is that you have p two, and that above p two, if you go p two plus something, you are very, very close to one, And if you take p2 minus something, you are very, very close to zero, thanks to these two in differential inequalities. So that was at least the motivation. So we want to use this theorem. This was just, it's not the proof of anything here, because I assume, I mean, I didn't tell you what A is, and I assume that all inferences are equal. But somehow it is the idea that we would like to use. We would like to use. Okay, consider, now consider n such that phi 1 p self dual q of n times 2n, I, I said 2 or 3? Three. Three. I put 3. 3n three is larger, larger than constant. And if I could apply this theorem, I would get that this probability is in fact polynomial equals to 1 for p strictly larger than p self dual because I would apply it to p self dual equal p0 and p equal p1. The problem is, I mean, this event here, the inferences are not the same, not the same at all. There is no reason why there should not be an inference in the middle which is much larger than others. It's difficult to believe for inferences in the middle because edge in the middle, you know, they look a little bit like their neighbors. I mean, the, the whole box is so far and so 
rough seen from here that you know neighbors are probably probably have the same uh, thing. So, but it's more problematic on the boundary. You could really imagine, for instance, that the edges here on the boundary have a much bigger influence than the others. That is not contradictory. But there is a proposition which tells you that, in fact, it's not the case. And this, I'm going to just sweep it under the carpet, not tell you how you do it. So actually, originally, our first proof of this result was involving a trick where you go on the torus and you symmetrize your event and you work with a symmetric event and then you bootstrap this information to the plane. But it was a little bit painful. Now we have a better trick, which is telling you, well, in fact, you can apply the sharp threshold. So all influences of uh, of A equal N, 3N. In fact, I'm cheating a little bit here. But, well, OK. There exists a K. Let's do it like that. Like that. It's a little bit less, less cheating. There exists a K between 2N and 3N such that uh, the max of the influences for the event that you cross the N times K box is smaller than 1 over N to a third. And this is a technical proposition. It's not so easy to get. And it's not actually even completely true what I'm writing, but that's fine. At least for the IDI, it's, it's sufficient. But that tells you that for some k, you can apply this thing. Here I'm lousy. Huh? I, I'm really not giving you a full proof, but I want just to give you the idea. So you can prove that the influences are not too big. So that gives you that um, it gives you that then um, there exists for every n larger or equal to one if phi p self dual q one of n times three n is larger than the constant c that I was talking about at the beginning, the infimum. So I uh, say the infimum. If this is true, then then if you have that, then phi 1 pq of n times 2n is going to be larger than 1 minus, so let's call it c, this guy, 1 minus 1 over c n to the minus small c, and here you get P minus P sub zero. So how would you do that? What you are going to say is, OK, let's take n such that you have this. Let's choose k such that the inferences are small. For this guy, you know that the derivative is big. The derivative is big, but it starts, you know, if, going, if crossing a box of size m times 3m occurs with priority m, uh, with good probability, that m times k is also going to occur with a I mean, it's going to occur with a larger probability because k is between 2n and 3n. Okay, so for this k at p self dual, I'm crossing with fairly good probability, and I have large influence. I have I have small influence. So this theorem is telling me exactly like for here that the derivative is going to satisfy something like that, and I can integrate between p self dual and p to get that, in fact, crossing a n times k at p is going to be larger than that. But if you manage to cross n times k, because k is larger than 2n, you also manage to cross n times 2n. So it's, it's, uh, this part is technical, but let me just, I mean, the only thing I want you to remember, because I'm anyway cheating you on this thing, so the only thing I want you to remember is that there is a trick to go around this problem of large influences, and it allows you to say that your crossing events they satisfy some sharp threshold. Just remember that. Okay? Exactly like the symmetric one would do. Okay? 
so it seems like we won, right? Now we have an n for which you have probability 1 minus a polynomial, which is exactly what we wanted. The only problem is what? Is that we have it only for infinitely many n. We don't have it for every n. Because we had that we are crossing n times 3n only for infinitely many n. So the last proposition is that, in fact, if you have this property for infinitely many n, you have it for every n. So the last proposition, which is also non-trivial, is that if uh, phi 1 pq n 2n larger than 1 minus n to the minus epsilon, say something like that, then phi 1, and in fact it's at p plus something. Well, OK, let's put p for infinity. Yeah. For every n. So this was just, once again, it was just to give you some hints of what is going on. In fact, in the, you are going to prove uh, in exercise, you are going to prove the two first, I mean, all the steps up to here. I think this one, maybe I'm going to skip it. Yeah. I missed the point. Yeah. Why we have only for all the infinity? Because what are we assuming? We ask, uh, OK, that was not good. Uh, so this is. Uh, is lim sup, right? We don't have that the infimum is, uh, is positive. We only have the lim sup. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So you have it for infinitely many n, and that's all. So just to, to tell you a little bit what this one is, I mean, maybe for those who made, uh, did the exercises for percolation, this last proposition should not look so scary. Because remember, by duality, what does it mean? By duality, this means what? This is exactly 1 minus the probability of having a crossing of a 2n by n box. OK? So what am I assuming here? I'm assuming that the probability of having a dual crossing of a n by 2n box is tending to 0. Right? But if you did the exercises, there was this exercise saying, if the probability of crossing an n by 2 n box in percolation is small enough, then you have exponential decay, in fact. That was one of the, the exercises, I think. So here it's going to be the same, basically. It's, you cannot apply the argument of percolation because it was using independence in many places, but you can adapt this argument, modify it a little bit, massage it a little bit to get something that works for random cluster model. And in fact, where I'm cheating you is that here it's going to work for every p prime larger than p. So that's somehow the cost you have to pay for not having independence is that you need to increment a little bit p. But that's OK, because um, for us it's OK. So that was a very rough sketch of the proof. Just two things that are important in it. The first one is that you need a rousseau semmel type argument at some point to start from. You know that you have crossings that are uh, of boxes to get to crossing of rectangles. And you have a second step, which is now you prove a sharp threshold. And the main argument is this can, can I a lineal uh, paper. And if you want to stop the understanding here, I'm completely fine with that. If you just want to remember if I have all inferences equal, then I have a sharp threshold. If this was clear for you, then it's sufficient. Because actually, you can prove it like that. You can get to it. Here is just, just to sketch the, the additional work you actually have to do if you really want to turn this into a rigorous proof. So that's PC. That was yeah, a sketch of PC equal uh, square root of Q over 1 plus square root of Q. And in fact, when you do this proof, you get exponential decay for free from the thing. Exactly because this last step is telling you, in fact, here, you could, I could replace by that in the proof. That's um, good. Uh, 
where am I? So I guess I'm almost done, or I can, yeah, maybe just stop it basically here by, by a last remark. So this was a sketch of the proof. This is a recent result, and it's 2012. So it's normal that it doesn't look so simple and so on. It's, it's not an easy result. And the corollary of that is that beta c of q is q minus 1 over q log of 1 per square root q. And in particular, for the easing model, it gives you that the critical value of the easing model is 1 half of log of 1 plus square root of 2. For the easing models, there are much simpler proofs. I mean, much simpler. I don't know if they are much simpler, but they are simpler proofs. OK, so let's stop here. Next week, can Kalai Lineal by uh, Matan. Maybe the week after that, you will look with him uh, whether uh, he manages to do it in two hours or not. Once again, it's interesting. It's not. You know, I just quoted it, but, uh, but somehow it is the heart of all these proofs. So I think it's, uh, it's very nice if you can have an idea of how you do that. And we meet again in three weeks where we are going to, this time, try to describe what is happening really at criticality. And then we are going to get a much stronger result than, uh, than this result by uh, Vincent, which in fact gives you more information on the critical phase. Thank you very much.